Turning now to the deportation case of Maria Juarez that we at One Detroit and the Detroit Journalism Cooperative have followed over the past month. We found out about Maria this spring. She's 23 years old, has a husband who is a U.S. citizen, and a baby. They lived in southwest Detroit. Maria was brought to this country illegally when she was just a baby, and a criminal history from her teenage years has impacted her ability to seek asylum, even though she had a job, paid taxes, and had turned her life around. Her story isn't typical, but really, when it comes to immigration and deportation, things are not usually as clear-cut as you would think. We told her story she tried to appeal her deportation in real time to try to understand not only the process, but the impact on families, discretion in the system, and how the policies of two administrations may have impacted her. Chastity pratt Dawsey from Bridge Magazine has her story. Maria Garcia Juarez lives in southwest Detroit with her husband, Eric, and one-and-a-half-year-old son, David. They're U.S. citizens but she's not. Born in Mexico, arriving with her mother, undocumented, at just eight months old. America is all she knows. So in three weeks, what happens? I have to leave the country or they will come and get me. I have to go back to my officer on the 16th of this month, and I have to show her a ticket leaving before the 25th of this month. Going where? To Mexico, straight to Mexico. Who do you know there? Nobody. I know I have family there. I don't know them. I don't have communication with them, but I have to go. Where are you gonna go? To be completely honest, I don't know right now. I really do not know. I'm still hopeful that a miracle can happen, something can happen. I know I can make you smile. <laughs> Jeez. When the day comes, Maria doesn't want to take her son with her. David has medical issues she fears can't be treated in Mexico. An even bigger complication, in January, her husband was diagnosed with leukemia. He's getting special treatments to stay alive. Maria might have been a typical DACA case, someone who came to America as a child and is allowed to stay. But at 17, she was arrested in Salinas, California, where she used to live. I committed a crime. I was in a stolen vehicle. I was caught in a stolen vehicle twice. Maria was behind the wheel, even leading police on a high-speed chase. Gangs and crime were a part of life in Salinas. Her mother arrested, then deported, while Maria and her sister were placed in the care of a family with its own criminal connections. As young, naive little girls, we really didn't know anything better. I mean, we grew up around that environment. We saw our mother doing it, and our dad was never in the picture, so what was there to expect? Maria spent time in juvenile detention and at an ice-holding facility. Then, at age 18, she joined her aunt and sister in Michigan. These past five years, Maria's been something of a model citizen, gainfully employed, taking college classes, but always under the watch of Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Maria's husband, Eric, has lost his hair from the chemotherapy, so he's camera shy, but he wants to talk. He's 22 years old. The truth is that in the next few weeks, my wife is going to be gone. I got to figure out how I'm going to do with my son. Got to figure out how I'm going to do with my sickness. Try to stay strong. I'm actually in bed. It's actually pretty late now, but um, unfortunately, I'm unable to sleep. I have been unable to sleep for these past few days, and it just seems to get worse. A week has passed. The next two weeks may be Juarez's last in the USA. Her attorney, Kareem Salah, believes she's done all she can. Why shouldn't she be deported? I mean, she's been here since she was eight months old. She made some bad choices. She was 17 years old, and she's completely turned her life around. I mean, I think, I think a lot of times with immigration, you look at these cases, um, you don't, they don't look at them as people. The problem? When Juarez stole a car, she was with a boy who was in a gang. That gang connection went on her record, a big red flag. That's part of the reason ICE wants to deport her now. All my charges are enhanced with a gang enhancement, which makes makes my whole case even worse. So who was this guy? So I grew up with him. He was um, 
His mother actually took me and my siblings in when my mother was in jail. She was not part of a gang, but you also have to consider her circumstances. I mean, we're, we would be more forgiving to anyone else in her situation. I'm Julie Reynolds. I'm a reporter and the co-producer of Nuestra Familia, Our Family. Julia Reynolds has been reporting on gangs in Salinas for 15 years, even writing a book and producing a documentary about the gang violence there. People try to stay away from gangs. That means sometimes staying away from your own family. It might mean staying away from your best friends, your cousins. It's not a practical thing for a child to do in many situations, to say, oh, I'm not going to get in a car with a gang member. But how did Juarez get labeled a gang member when she said she was not? She says her public defender told her to plead guilty not knowing it would hurt her chances to stay in the country later on. Her school counselor at the time, Gina Jett, confirms the situation. Your public defender tells you to plead guilty to gang enhancements and you, you will be released. Remember, you are 17 years old. You want out of juvenile hall. All juveniles want out of juvenile hall. You follow the public defender's advice. What do you say to those people who say, look, the law is what it is. You have to go. You're not an American. So what would I say to them? What benefits them, me leaving to Mexico and leaving my husband ill here and my son, who's only a year and a half? I am not a criminal. I am not a criminal. It should, a mistake I made while I was a child should not define who I am today. The government has given war as a choice. She can pick a place in Mexico to fly to next week, but she has to prove she's purchased an airline ticket this week. I actually don't know much about Mexico. <laughs> I've never been there, so everything, wherever I go, it's gonna be completely new to me. But where would she go? Thanks to her grandmother, she's made contact with an uncle she's never met who lives near Guadalajara. Yeah, pero cuesta más. She talked to him. I called him and now, you know, he knows that I'll be going over there soon. So I mean, definitely, I mean, I don't know them. <laughs> I really don't know them, but I have to go. What it looks like is that I will be leaving. As much as I would want to fight it here, there's definitely not a big guarantee. So what it looks like, I'll be leaving to Mexico on May 26th. Um, and I mean, unfortunately, they couldn't give me any better news or any better hope. We are talking about deportation. We're talking about immigration. How complicated the stories are that involve the people who are at the center of these debates. With just a few days left, Juarez has taken to the airwaves with her story. I definitely don't mind sharing my story and, you know, letting people know that this is not okay. Maria Garcia Juarez is getting ready to leave for Mexico this week as she faces deportation. Juarez also has a new lawyer, immigration specialist Brad Thompson. She was advised by previous immigration attorneys that because of her convictions, she would not be eligible for specifically deferred action for childhood arrivals, which is also abbreviated DACA. This looks like her last chance. All her hopes are riding on her immigration officer's decision. We, in about 24 hours, put together a DACA application and an emergency stay of removal. And we were asking the discretion of the field office here in Detroit not to deport her. I went on Friday morning, I handed over the letter, and she told me, she said, I'm not going to see anything until I see the paperwork. So she's giving you an opportunity to file the emergency stay. As far as, you know, her reaction and what I interpreted, yes, she's giving me an opportunity because she would have said no. And from my understanding, as long as it's submitted, if it's pending, I cannot be deported until they make a decision on it, as far as I understand. Even with the emergency stay, Juarez doesn't expect it to last long, a few days, maybe a bit more. Then again, ICE could decide she doesn't have to leave at all. The stay doesn't work. What does Friday look like? So Friday, I have uh, ISIS meeting me at the airport at 6.30 in the morning. They're going to wait. You know, I say goodbye to my family, and they wait till my plane departs. Friday, May 26, 2017, the beginning of the Memorial Day weekend. For Maria Garcia Juarez, this is Deportation Day. 
Her family has come to Detroit Metropolitan Airport to say goodbye. There's still hope she might get the stay from ICE based on the new papers she's filed last week. Inside that packet, ICE has Juarez's passport and there's ICE's response to her request for a stay. Okay. So this one should have got sent to your attorney also. To go. Maria's request for a stay is denied. It's a nonstop flight to Mexico City where she'll connect to Guadalajara to meet an uncle she's never seen before. Everybody say goodbye? Yes. It could very well be 10 years before she has a chance to come back to the only country she knows. Joining me now to um, answer some final questions about Maria's case and to put it really all into context is Bill Kubota. He's a journalist who works with us here at Detroit Public TV out of our Detroit bureau. It's always good to see you, Bill. And also joining us again is Diego Bonasati. He's the legal director for Michigan United, which is an organization that helps people with immigration issues. And Chastity pratt Dawsey of Bridge Magazine, the reporter on Maria's story. It's good to have you all here with us. And we finally saw the story laid out all at once um, that we've been we've been chronicling. Bill, I'm going to start with you. Can you tell us how Maria is doing? Have you been in touch with her family and her? We've uh, heard about her through her husband, Eric. She's doing OK. She's not in a bad part of town in the city near Guadalajara, where she's living now with her uncle, but she's kind of stuck in her house. She and there's only one car in that family, and she's trying to figure out what to do. You can only um, imagine, we can only imagine what the immersion would be like for someone who has lived in the United States their entire life and going back to a place that they have no familiarity to. Right. She's, uh, even uh, her Spanish is going to be different than the Spanish spoken in, in Mexico. They're going to know she's an American and they treat uh, Americans of Mexican descent differently than Mexicans. There's, there's a lot of problems there with that. What about Eric's health? He's doing okay. He's going to uh, get a uh, bone marrow transplant. They found a match, but uh, you know it's going to be a few weeks, and it might be a long time if he can do it to go to Mexico to visit his wife and take her, his son with them. Bill, you worked a lot with Chastity on on this project. Chastity, what has the reaction been um, in chronicling Maria's story? I know you've posted it on Bridge Magazine as well, and you can only read the comments below. But what have people been telling you about running this this kind of story or seeing Maria's story? It's one of those situations where people have an opinion about the issue until they see how it impacts real people. Uh, some people, are, the hardliners, you know, they're not going to move. But some people have emailed me saying, did she get to stay? What's going on? How's she doing? Um, when, when you, as journalists, really get under the skin and show how policies impact families, how people's real lives are torn apart by things, people care. And as journalists, that's really our job, to, to bring it home to people. Diego, I have some legal questions, I guess, and some things that still kind of stand out for me and, and hang for me here. So it could be 10 years before she's able to come back to the United States. Explain that. So the, the law says that if you've been in the country either on expired papers or without papers for a year or longer past age 18, and then you leave, you trigger a 10-year bar to coming back. So she did that with her departure. Um, she's also got the deportation. Now, she can seek waivers of both of those. Um, based on hardship to her husband. So what's that process there? We're talking, you know, usually a year to two years, right, to, for him to file a petition, for her to ultimately get her interview um, in Juarez, Mexico, and to have those, those uh, waivers approved. Another thing that people have been asking me, saying, well, she was married to a U.S. citizen. How come she automatically isn't a U.S. citizen as well? What's that process? Well, it used to be prior to 1940, uh, if an American woman married a foreign man, she lost her U.S. citizenship and gained his, and vice versa. Um, that's no longer the case. Uh, the U.S. pulled out of those agreements in the Second World War, and so you have the, the citizen has to file a petition, and then uh, the immigrant has to show that she doesn't trigger any of the bars, or if she does, that she has a waiver available to her. And the other issue is, correct me if I'm wrong, Diego, she came here without a visa. And coming here without a visa and marrying someone doesn't mean you automatically become a citizen. 
you're still going to have to go through the ropes. You know, another thing that's triggered in this story for, for a lot of people, Chastity, is trying to um, categorize it in terms of one administration, presidential administration, and policies versus another. Her deportation notice was triggered under the Obama administration, and now she's been deported under the Trump administration. Are there differences in policies that would have made a difference in, in her case? That's what people are asking now. Well, there's differences in how the policies are being put into action. And during the uh, Obama administration, I'm told the discretion that exists within the the process would have maybe shown her a little more um, leeway or a little uh, mercy, uh, if you will. However, under the Trump administration, you're talking about the president who wants to build the wall between here and Mexico. Mexicans very definitely are getting a lot of scrutiny. And in situations like this, in, in our region, ICE has been told yeah, you have discretion, but you should not use it. That is null and void. Follow the letter of the law. There's not going to be very much leeway given anyone under the Trump administration. That's been the edict. And so that that is the, the question for me, and Diego, let me ask you in terms of discretion, because we hear all the time that when judges have cases, there there's the, they can take different things into account. And we saw, and, and Bill, you explained so eloquently, I think, about the gang issue in Salinas, kind of someone being thrust into a position that they had really no control over a little bit and making decisions as a juvenile, which in this country, a lot of times juvenile records are white clean when you become an adult. Um, but talk to me a little bit about what discretion could have been used here in this case, Diego. Well, I mean, ultimately the, the director of ICE can determine and say, look, this is going to impact a U.S. citizen, uh, and in fact, two U.S. citizens, right? Her husband mm -hmm. and her child. And so for, for that, out of humanitarian concerns or they could also conclude in the public interest because this this person might he's not going to be supported by anybody right or who is going to support him um, and so her presence here is important for that uh, they could have extended the the prosecutorial discretion on their own on their own they, this is separate from from the construct that the Obama administration had built mm -hmm. um, and the other thing about juvenile dispositions in in immigration law in general a juvenile disposition cannot be used to deport as a basis of deportation or to bar somebody. In in certain cases, it's it's a uh, you know they they look at it as a matter of discretion right here. Yeah. The Trump has put discretion out the window. Yeah. It shows how complicated things can be, and that there is no one set of circumstances that you can judge these cases on. Bill, I'm going to let you wrap this up because we're running out of time. In terms of what you have learned from this, what you take from this, and, and being able to, to tell Maria's story in, in this capacity. It's pretty complex. I mean, you're talking about all these things going on, and you look at the individual case of one person and say, she's a good person. I mean, she's somebody we should have in our city. She's taxpayer. She's doing all the right things. She's turned her life around. Uh, she's redeemed herself. But that past is what's going to probably keep her out of the country for a long time. And you're going to continue to follow her story and yeah. stay in touch with the family. All right, well, we can't wait to see really what happens next. Bill Kubota, Diego Bonasati, thanks so much for joining me, as well as Chastity pratt Dawsey. We'll continue to follow the reporting on this. And that's going to do it for My Week. For more on Maria's story, including our full reports, head to myweek.org. We'll have a link there to the work that we've done with the Detroit Journalism Cooperative on this case.